Good morning. Welcome to our worship on this 21st Sunday after Pentecost. The Lord is with you. And also with you. Amen. Well, the special day is uh, upon us. It's uh, just one week away, the 150th anniversary of the church. And we rejoice. And I'm just trusting that there's going to be a real good group that's going to be here on that day. And those tickets are still available. And I would imagine, even if uh, there's somebody at the last minute uh, after today, that there's still, we can still squeeze you in. So, but uh, please, uh, if you haven't gotten a ticket, uh, do and think about you know, reserving some tickets for some other people. That would be wonderful. Also, uh, do note that it's going to be at 10 o'clock, so if you come at 9 o'clock, you're going to have a, a more time for meditation in the pew. <laughs> but that's, uh, it's going to be at that hour, so again, we could have that lunch after we're uh, closer to, to the noon hour. And also, uh, last week, it was just before uh, service began, I was upstairs. I usually have a prayer with the organist. And and uh, she threw a curveball, and uh, Jean, we love her, and uh, she's been here longer than I have, and uh, she's moving up to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and it's going to be, uh, her last Sunday is, is going to be Reformation Sunday on the 31st. So if you have the opportunity just to uh, greet her and wish her well. Uh, but we also are going to have a special coffee hour on the 31st for her after the service, so Please uh, plan on attending that, but uh, Jim, we're going to miss you madly, and we really will. I think we be could begin now, um, which, well, just stay in the pew and we'll uh, sing the first hymn. from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and say, God, be merciful to be a sinner. Almighty God. Almighty God, merciful Father, 
In holy baptism, you declared us to be your children and gathered us into your one holy church, in which you daily and richly forgive us our sins and grant us new life through your spirit. Be in our midst, enliven our faith, and graciously receive our prayer and praise through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Say, be seated, please. divine wisdom sets in order all things in heaven and on earth. Put away from us all things hurtful and give us those things that are beneficial for us. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The scripture readings. Our Old Testament lesson is taken from Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 10 through 20. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This is also vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them, and what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. There is, a grievous and evil, there, there is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? Moreover, all his days he eats in darkness, in much vexation, and sickness, and anger. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given him. For this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil. This is the gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. This is the word of the Amen. Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Our epistle reading is from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter the rest as he has said. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again this passage he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received, formerly received the good news failed to enter, because of disobedience. Again, he appoints a certain, today, certain day. Today, saying through David, so long afterward, in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath of rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest, has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him whom we, whom we must give account. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and grace to the help and find grace to help in the time of need. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you rise for the gospel? Well, The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who, can, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, see, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses, brothers, sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in this and the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. Would you be seated, please?
grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord God, Heavenly Father, I pray for your Holy Spirit in these moments, uh, your Spirit that gives us sense and sensibility, opens our eyes to, to truths and perspectives that otherwise we would not grasp in this life. May your Spirit do this good work. May you bless this time of meditation. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you be seated, please? The Lord is with you. Can we see that first slide? Millard Fuller uh, uh, grew up in the 1950s. something to become a millionaire. And by his account, he gave his wife everything that she could have wanted. But one day he came home and she was gone. She just left a note. And Millard went after her and he found her in New York City. She was in a hotel. It was a Saturday night. And they spoke until the wee hours of the morning. And she said to him, though he had, she had received so much, she was coming up empty. She uh, sensed in her life that uh, those uh, things that she had received were just not working to bring fulfillment in her life. She just wanted to have a new start. She said she wanted to, to live again. Uh, it just was not working for her, this life, with all the money. And so, um, in that place, they bowed at, uh, before their bed, and they determined that they were going to start over again, and they were going to sell everything they had, and devote themselves to helping people in need. And the next day was a Sunday, and so they went to a Baptist church, and they told the pastor what they had determined to do, this new beginning sell everything and just start over and help other people. And ironically, the pastor said, this is something that was too radical. They didn't have to do that. And Fuller uh, said afterwards that the minister did not understand it was not just about the money and possessions. He said, we were just giving. So again, it was uh, that was a situation, and soon thereafter, Fuller and his wife moved to southwest Georgia. They uh, became involved in an interracial community. They, they had a lot of children. And soon he began uh, a small ministry to help people to be able to get better housing. And eventually, that morphed into an organization called Habitat for Humanity. And is now in all 50 states and in 70 nations. A marvelous ministry. But what did this man do? He said he just gave it all up. And that's really the essence, I believe, of the message of today's lesson of Jesus and the rich man. And the rich man was a, more of a miller Fuller type of an individual. Uh, he had uh, achieved, uh, in a sense, a great trophy in life, and that he was rich. And back in those days, a person was considered to be blessed by God because they were rich. It was God's special blessing on them. So this man had this sense of achievement, and he wanted one more trophy. He wanted eternal life. And that's what he asked Jesus for. And it says in St. Mark that Jesus looked at him and that he loved him. 
But then Jesus said these words. Can we see the next slide? You lack one thing, go sell all that you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven and come, follow me. And I think most of you know what happened. The man left very sorrowfully. And what did Jesus do? He was exposing this man's allegiance to his property, to his possessions, to his money. And Jesus was uh, putting him in a, at a crossroads where he had to make a choice. Is it going to be his money and possessions or is it going to be following Jesus? But what does that say for us today? Is it that we are called as people to give up everything in order to follow Jesus? Some people would say so. Some people say that in order to really follow Jesus, that's what you need to do is to give up everything and sell it and give it to the poor and then to follow him. However, the New Testament does really not support this because even Jesus' disciples still had their boats when they left him and to follow him. So it's not that you have to give up everything to follow him when it comes to your possessions. However, what does this passage mean for our lives? We can breathe a sigh, breathe a sigh of relief. It's, uh, we don't have to sell everything, but what does it mean for our day-to-day -day living, this passage of Scripture? And I believe it has to do with those words that Millard uh, Fillard spoke after he had talked to the Baptist minister. Can we see him again, please? He just didn't understand that we weren't giving up money and the things that money could buy. We were giving up, period. We were giving up, period, is what Fuller said. Giving up, period. And that's, again, what Miller Fuller did. He was willing to give up uh, his way of achievement, being a self-made man. He was giving up trying to be the king of the mountain. And can you remember a time, especially you fellows, um, playing king of the mountain, king of the hill, when you were younger? Uh, something I did. You would try to push all the other kids off, and so you would sit at your throne at the top, be king of the mountain. But I've noticed, and perhaps you've noticed too, that when it comes to playing king of the mountain, it doesn't stop with youth. It continues in life where there are many people who want to strive to be at the top. And that's the way it was for this rich young man. He wanted to be at the top and he was showing Jesus his merit badges. He had kept this commandment, that commandment, the commandments. But Jesus was looking for something else. He was looking for his heart. He was looking for this man to give up the throne of his heart where it was money and possessions and give it to him. He wanted this man to give up uh, being the God of me, being the autonomous man, and to let it go and to let Jesus be on the throne of his life. Uh, nothing in my hands I bring simply to that cross I cling. So that was a call uh, upon this man. But it was not easy to do something like this. It was a, a real struggle, and the man walked away. And the disciples, again, are rather amazed because they know that this is a pious man, a pious young man, a faithful young man to Judaism. So they're amazed. And then Jesus goes on to say after the man has left, how difficult it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Again, uh, they're really shocked to hear this because they have thought that being rich was God's blessing. And then Jesus went on to say something that floored them. And can we see the next slide? 
It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Well, and over the years I've heard uh, various interpretations of this. It's a vivid metaphor. And back in that society, uh, the camel was the largest animal in that culture. And the eye of a needle was the smallest. And again, just trying to picture in your mind, try to understand what Jesus was trying to get across by this. And for me, the way that I try to understand it is when uh, Jesus was talking to Nicodemus and mentioned to him, uh, unless you're born again, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. And I think it relates to that, that when a, someone's going through that birth canal, you can't bring anything else with you. I mean, to be able to get through to the other side, it's just you and you alone. And again, not any of your merits, not any of your trophies, that's it. Just you getting through. But again, this is hard, isn't it? To be able to comprehend this and to, to live with this understanding, my goodness. And when it came to this uh, young man, he couldn't do it. But are you there when it comes to this understanding? That it's not by anything that you have done, no trophies, no merits, but it's only, only by the grace of God that you're going to be able to enter into heaven. And again, it was difficult back in that time. This young man owned property, but really in a sense his property owned him and that property was on the throne of his life. But is it any easier today when it comes to this whole issue? And back in the 1970s, and I've shared this before, the old Lutheran Brotherhood, did a survey and they asked uh, Lutherans, and this was back in a time where, uh, in the 70s, where many more of us Lutherans were around, but also they were much in the catechism and had uh, understandings from their growing up in the Lutheran school. And so they were asked that question, well, how do you get to heaven? But before I give you the answer, if you were walking along the street and met somebody you know, that was uh, another Christian and you asked them, how do you get to heaven? What do you think most people would say? Well, 53% in that survey, I live a good life. It's by living a good life. But basically that's saying that you're in the savior business, that you're gonna save yourself. And again, ultimately what this message from this lesson is all about, it's spiritual bankruptcy. That's the way you enter. Not by any merits whatsoever on your part, but simply cling to the grace of God and to the cross of Jesus. And in our lesson today, again, the disciples are floored when Jesus uh, puts this man on the spot and he's called upon just to give up his riches. I mean, that's huge for a man in, that, in this position just to give up everything. They couldn't do it. But again, there, it's even more so as Jesus goes on and say, saying that the chances of him getting to heaven are as slim as a, as a camel getting through the eye of a needle. And so no wonder Jesus' disciples are asking the question, well, then who's going to get in? Then who can be saved? That's what they're asking. But in our lesson, uh, Jesus then comes up with, I would say, is the escape clause. And this is what he says. May we see the next slide. Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. It is possible with God. 
It is possible with God to enter into the kingdom. It's even possible, even though that, of that regarding the fatal hold of possession, which all of us struggle with, that fatal hold of possessions upon our lives, to be the, on the throne of our lives. But nevertheless, it's possible with God to be freed of that fatal hold. But frankly, it's not just that God mammon that Jesus talks about. It's also, when it comes to our lives, these other gods that are vying for position in our lives, on the throne of our lives. Food, um, pleasures, entertainment, sports, um, family, romance, the God of romance in our society. Those are all huge when it comes to this struggle and this vying for position in people's hearts and lives being number one. And frankly, we can't do it. We do not have the strength within ourselves to be able to overcome these gods. They're just that strong. But we do have the Holy Spirit. And that's the great blessing for each one of our lives, that the Spirit continues to work. And the Spirit continues to, to work to bring us to the cross of Jesus Christ. And to there, to open our eyes, to be able to perceive this love of God through the course of our days. To see this love of God that is so powerful, that even though we are experiencing the depths of our sin, the more we see the depths of our sin, even more so we see the depths of God's grace and his love. So that's really what happens. As God is working in our lives, we're in a sense that these idols are not erased from our lives, but they are replaced by this greater love of Christ. That's this, the work of, of the spirit in each one of our lives to bring us to that point. So it's possible with God, uh, and will happen with God through the work of his spirit, so that in our final days, we will say in our hearts and our of hearts when it comes to money, possessions, when it comes to friends, when it comes to sports, entertainment, and all those things. It's not it. We will say, Jesus, you are my everything. That's what we'll say, by God's spirit. That's the way the Spirit is moving us, by God's grace. So that's what Millard Fuller was talking about when it came to giving up. Again, it was the throne of his life. But let it be known, when it came to Millard Fuller, no doubt through the course of his days, he struggled with those other gods in his life, as we all do. But nonetheless, he would know that victory of the Spirit in his life. And Jesus promises in our lesson to those who would do like Fuller did, that there would be a great blessing, and he says that to his disciples, a, I mean, a hundredfold blessing in this life and the life to come. And can you imagine for Fuller, as he's going through his life and his ministry with Habitat for Humanity, the sense of richness of spirit, the sense of gratification, and where he had been involved in making such a difference in people's lives. How rich this man was in spirit. And when it comes to our lives, I mean, are, are, are you there yet? We're in that process, aren't we? And if, do you think very much about what Jesus is talking about, that, that life to come, that future life? And I think it, it happens, uh, especially if you've lost something in your life that's very precious, like your spouse. But dare we not forget the blessing you know, of deferred richness in the future. I mean, isn't that what motivates people to work so hard till they're 65 or 66 or longer so that they might be able to Get that retirement. I mean, that's the dangling carrot in their lives. 
And in our lesson, Jesus unblushingly promises a hundredfold return. So that's, that means if you invest a hundred, it gives you 10,000. I mean, it's, it's huge as what he's promising. And so what does that, again, mean for our lives? Uh, uh, this, this richness that there will be that one day that there will be the, the throne, we'll see Christ face to face, rank upon rank of, of angels, but no longer will we have these earthly bodies that can make life difficult for us. No more pain, no more sorrows, no more tears, no more the news where there's so much brokenness and calamity in this world. But again, it will all be past, and there will be the new life with him. And so that's what Jesus is talking about in our lesson, these marvelous blessings. And so he encourages us, again, just to be willing to give up as go that way of Millard Fuller and to trust that we will get and that we will get what will never be taken away, eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts, keep your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Would you rise for the creed as you're able? I believe in one God, the Father of Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten of being, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men, came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. I believe, my Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who is so by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I know the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Would you be seated? We continue with the prayers. Lord of the universe, we praise you for your word, the manual for life, for its teachings to give us perspective and balance in our lives. It's so easy to be caught up with those gods. By your Holy Spirit, grant us obedient hearts which desire to meet the needs of others before our own. We thank you for the example of Millard Fuller, who got off the throne of his life and who then reached out to others who were in need. Oh Lord, it is such a battle, those gods that are in this world, by your spirit, continue to lead us to recognize your sacrifice, to witness again your love, yes, to see the depths of our sin, but even more so the, the depths of your forgiveness and your love and your grace, which far surpasses it, so that we might again be able to experience that nudging off of those idols and where you would be our everything. And that we would be moved again to be those who are compassionate, 
and reaching out to those who are in need around us. Lord, in your mercy, As we, Lord, have broken down all the dividing walls of hostility, as you have done this, by the salvation won through your work on the cross, use us even as your peacemakers to draw our neighbors, others around us, to your gift of forgiveness and life. May it be so that there would be change in their lives, that they might be able to know the richness of your grace and your mercy and that gift of life that is eternal. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, as we come to the, the throne of grace and mercy, we give you thanks for the healing medicine of your son's body and blood. May his life pulse in us as we praise you and live to your glory. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And Lord, we thank you for your blessing to Richard Lump, his ninth great granddaughter, grandchild who was born, Naomi. May you continue to bless this, uh, this little girl. Uh, Lord, in your mercy. And gracious God, may you bless our nation when it comes to resettlement. Thousands of people uh, in different places of our country. Uh, we pray that uh, this would go well, that uh, there would be a spirit of compassion so that these people would be able to make adjustments and not become hardened, but again, to experience thankfulness uh, with the new life set before them. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And Lord, we pray for the Texas law regarding uh, abortion, trying to prohibit it. May you continue to bless legislators. May there be a continued pushback regarding the darkness, that your truth would prevail, and that there would be a, a revelation more fully in our secular society of your way and your will. Lord, in your mercy. And Lord, continue to bless your servant, Ken Markworth, who's now in a Lutheran home. May you soon be able to leave that place. We thank you that he is getting stronger. Also, we pray for Marlene Johnson, who's had difficult days. May you further strengthen her. Also, we pray for Fred and Jeanette Mashman, both who know of weakness of body. For Kathy Prophet, who's going to be and treatments for months. Further bless her, we ask. Also, thank you that Stephen Davison's uh, working more. May that continue. Sam Tormina's uh, uh, on the mend. May you further strengthen him. Also, we pray for Eric Bobkin, Matthew Gardner, who's receiving treatments. And Liliana Don, Jack Shannon, Don Miller, and Lynn Morgan. May they know of your grace upon grace your healing and your good time and your good way. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And Lord, we thank you for Glenn and Dottie Schwigo, married 61 years. Uh, may it be that uh, you would bless them and uh, they would uh, come back to be part of our fellowship someday soon. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And now, Lord, uh, we pray as you have taught us to pray. Our Father. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Amen.